Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you want to support these programs, you can head over to oxum.substack.com and subscribe there at just about a coffee price a month. You can also subscribe or join rather directly the YouTube channel at $5 or even $1 a month. Some people are crazy. They even do $25 a month. There's also many levels at patreon.com slash Aksum. Our special guest today is Deacon Simon, AKA Simeon. How are you doing? I'm good, brother. Glory to God. Amen. Uh, welcome to the podcast. And you know, sometimes I like reflecting on our names. My sisters have, uh, one of them has an anglicized biblical name, and the other one has kind of a common Greek name. And because of that, I felt they've always been able to blend in and assimilate in American culture. Um, I think I have as well, by the way, and maybe in some ways better, but I think almost every conversation when I meet someone who's not Habesha surrounds my name. Like literally a couple days ago, I was substitute teaching at a particular school. And um, I even go just by my last name, which is more assimilatory, which is Elias, right? You know, Elias, but Elias or Elias, if you're Mexican or some other Spanish speaker. And, uh, but somehow they still ended up dwelling on my first name. And I don't know if you've had that, but I'd like to hear your take on um, Simeon, because from what I understand, it's kind of like even even my my father's name, Elias, there's Elias and there's Elijah, and they both are kind of translations of the same name. We see this with James and Jacob and some other biblical names. My assumption is Simeon is the same as Simon, but it's like one is translated directly from Hebrew and one from Greek. But if you know anything else about kind of your name and how people have grown up interacting with your name, I'd love to hear it. So my name, uh, people call me, I, I don't like uh, preferably when people call me Simeon. I rather people call me someone okay. because of the, I prefer the Mark, uh, mm -hmm. Mark pronunciation of it. When people would call me Simeon in the elementary school and middle school, I would I would correct them and instead have them call me uh, Simone. Mm -hmm. Pronounce it that way because I feel like that pronunciation make more sense because it, it seems it would be closer to the Giz Mark uh, pronunciation of my name. So I don't like when people call me uh, uh, call me Simeon. Preferably, I prefer people just call me Simone. Just because. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, so that's so that's good. So you you corrected them too. So see, I've had weird stages in my life where sometimes I corrected them, and sometimes I just didn't care. Like sometimes I would give them like the anglicized Enoch just so I don't have to have that conversation. But you you were were you always kind of forceful about them pronouncing it as correctly as possible? Yeah, since I was young, I always uh, corrected people off of that because. People will call my call me by different pronounce my name in like a lot of different weird ways, which didn't even make sense when you hear it. What are some other ways they would say it? Like Sim Simeon? Like I hear some people when they refer to the Semain Mountains of Gwandar that are uh, near uh, a monastery we'll talk about later, our beloved Waldeba Monastery. But um, I hear them refer to the Semain Mountains sometimes as Simeon. Is that ever a pronunciation anyone's ever said? Oh yeah, definitely. People people call me, pronounce my name Simeon like like the Simeon monkey. Oh yes, yes. You, you know what? I yeah, I think the monkey comes from that area, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was even like a super villain monkey who got some sort of super intelligence because he was launched into space in some cartoon I watched as a kid. I really forget what it was called, but it was like the main character was this kind of quiet superhero monkey. I don't know if you've seen that one. I think I know. I think it sounds familiar. Yeah. And did your parents ever tell you about the meaning of it? Or did you ever pursue the the kind of uh, biblical Hebrew meaning of it on your own? My parents told me the meaning of it. They told me that it means, uh, translates to God heard. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think, I think that's right, and it's yeah. related to our Amharic word for that as well, which is like you know, samma. So you could, you could definitely, you could tell the those cousin languages are are related yeah. there. Yeah. A funny story actually about when I was, my parents were picking out my name, my grandpa, um, God rest his soul, he's passed on now. Um, um, he, um, he, he was telling my my parents. Uh, why well, add the extra? You just make it Simon, so it'd be pr easier for 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 Andros to pronounce. It'd be easier for for them to pronounce it. Or just drop the e. But my parents are like, no, we want to make we want to make it with the e. We want to make it unique. You know what? You just told me something there that kind of impresses me off the bat. Not everybody's grandparents like know English. So your <laughs> your grandpa knew English. Was he living in the United States or was he living back home? Oh no, he was uh, originally he's originally from back home, but he was uh, he he was coming a lot of time in the United States to to babe to babysit me when my parents would be away at work and my grandma, my grandpa he used to he used to work for United Nations so um for many years so he had a lot of experience with English he was doing you know, a lot of work around the country going different different regions and um, helping them with certain stuff. And he was also he was also a deacon in the church actually. At, I was uh, just going to ask you that. I yeah, was just going to ask you that. Yes, he was a deacon back in Gondor de Rohan He was. He oh used to, yeah, that's he, a famous was, parish with the yeah. icons, right? Of the yes. of the cherubim. Yes, his father, I mean my great grandpa, was was the Adaka or Astadadar of de Rohan Selassie at the time. So yes, he was he was a member of the clergy as well. Wow. Yeah. So you're almost like from a lineage of priests and deacons then. So th that's what I was going to ask you is because a lot of times when I see people faithful in the church, I, I ask this question and I ask this question in real life. And I ask this question on the podcast often too, because I'm very interested in parenting and there are kind of two main approaches people take. One approach is uh, the approach that I received from my parents where they were very hands off and they they made me kind of become orthodox christian by baptizing me and taking me occasionally to high holidays but in reality um they never imposed prayer on a daily basis or anything they sent me to a couple christian schools my middle school and my college they actually influenced me for that and um you know by taking me to ethiopia and then high holidays like i won't say they did nothing in terms of contributing, but I would say they pretty much were hands off. And the other method we see is parents who are very kind of strongly compelling their kids to go to church every Sunday. And I don't know how their Monday to Saturday routine is, but you know, like maybe imposing fasts on them, maybe having them involved in charity and, and almsgiving, things like that. And um, I don't know, is it better to push strong on a kid and um, you know, then he'll go the way, as it says in Proverbs, or do you kind of do it in a hands-off way so they rebel against you by becoming religious, which is my story. So I wonder, uh, could you tell me the religious background of your parents and how they raised you? Yeah, sure. So my parents, um, very, very devout Orthodox Christian. My mom, she, she's, uh, she was, she's been a Muslim run for 30 plus years wow 35 30 probably like 30 32 plus years since the in old, the united states or in ethiopia as well in the united states since the very early 90s she was one of the founding choir members of saint michael's in dallas wow actually, she, she was the first she was part of the first founding group it was a so she's been around for a very long time very involved in church um and they my parents uh, i would say they didn't they never for forced me to do anything never never pushed me just they encouraged me they would be like my mother she'd be like when i was like four i was having debates with her and i should sing with them she's like if you want to do it she was like it would, it would be good it would be good for for you to sing and if you but if you don't want to then i won't hold against you this is your this is your, your choice but i would really be good for you so she so, so she never really like pushed me into like into doing stuff in the church. She's kind of encouraged me a little bit and said the choice is up to yours. 
And was your father a deacon? And, and whose side was your grandpa and your great-grandfather who were the deacon and the, the priest and administrator? Uh, my grandpa and great-grandpa, they were on my mom's side. Okay, on your mom's my dad, side. My dad, my dad is a lay person in the church. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how how about the decision for you then to become a deacon? Like, were you ever a member of the choir as a kid before you became a deacon? Or did you become a deacon and you never went through the, the choir? Oh, no, I was I was involved in the choir from early age. So I was like, so I was like four or five. I was I was at joined the choir. Uh, wow, yeah, that's super young. In, in Michaels in Dallas, I was at I joined the choir when I was like four there. I was I sang there for many years until um, we had to leave St. Michael's because some uh, complicated issues. And then I joined uh, when I came here to, to climb on. Uh, I joined the choir there initially. And and uh, how did how about when you were ordained into the diaconate how old were you and how you know how long has it been uh i was ordained a deacon when i was 13 in the year 2013 so on the house so it'll be a couple of months it'll be 10 years nice nice congratulations yeah much longer than me i i joined in uh 2015 and i was a uh, much much older of course um, <laughs> um, what type of requirements or understanding of uh, the job, let's call it, you know, it's really a vocation. So let me say the vocation, but what, yeah. what type of understanding did you have at the time? And who is it that, like, did your parents explain it to you? Did the bishop who ordained you explain it to you? Did your local priest explain it to you? Honestly, those. It was a variety of people that explained to me. First, first it was um, the priests, uh, the priests of my church. Uh, Memory Tadessa is one of them. Uh, he's a old, he's the old priest of mine that I've no, that he's known me since my since birth. He saw me get baptized, so he, so I, I've known him all my life. And also Abayi Um He was guiding, he was guiding me and telling me a lot about like what the role entailed, like like. Uh, how it's not simply just a regular job, it's like a life commitment. Mm -hmm. And also my grandpa, um, Russell, before he died, when he found out that I was started learning to become a deacon, he sat me down like, and he talked to me about like the requirements of a deacon, like which, how you have to live your life. So he like really sat me down. And I think those those conversations I, I had, um, it really shaped helped me get like focus and understand like what what job the opportunity that I'm about to receive how like how important it is and how it's a lifelong thing and how I need to like I, I need to be serious about it. So I think those, those conversations helped shape me a lot in my understanding of it. That's beautiful. And did your grandfather begin teaching you any? of like the prayers and is or any of the sort of basics or did all the responsibility fall upon the the priests at your local church um my my grandfather he he taught me one prayer he taught me a so i love because when he was coming over to my cousins the, the one we say after we eat yes mm -hmm. at first i was having trouble learning it because he he was he was in Ohio with my other cousins and we would go to visit them on summer breaks occasionally and he taught the, all of them so about the, all the, all of them the, the, my cousins they're they're girls in, in that house so he taught he taught all of them so about love and they they say it they would say it every every time after they finished eating he would tell them he would tell them one of the girls like okay you say so about love because there's no there would be no one else to, to say it besides him and he wanted them to get the understanding of it so they they were taught sabat love um early on and i remember he was he, he was uh, telling me he was like he was like he was like as an example not as an example he's like look at you see you see them uh they're learning sabat love you have to get on you have to learn like them yeah, learn that and he started teaching so he was love. trying to shame you 
<laughs> not sure, just more of motive motivation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Deacon, someone you might end up being my cousin. I have a lot of Gondari, especially of the Walkite variety cousins in Ohio. I don't know them all. I know I know a few, but my, my mom always warned me before I was married, you better be careful and ask around if you're <laughs> moving around Ohio. <laughs> um, so that's good. So he did that. And then uh, what about at the priests at your church? Do they expect you to just learn by yourself in 2013? I don't know how expansive Debodo and eat the book and ethiopianorthodox.org were were you expected to learn anything on your own or were you kind of um, given a rigorous training protocol from one of the priests no i was so um a couple months before bayamana came to my ch church from from portland um i was mean like some other deacons already got ordained at the time we were learning with uh, my old priest his name is memory Todd Dessa. um he was teaching us uh, just some basic stuff he was teaching us uh, basic how to hit um, cover amatat uh, or how, how to how to how to do mahalit um and uh some so how, how to hit the drums in the early morning singing and some and some gandasi people parts mm -hmm. he, ta he taught us that and then when Ambayamana finally came, uh, I started really rigorous Gadasi training with him, and uh, he, I learned with him I, uh, for about a year. I, I in a year time, yeah, I, I completed Gizan Izo Gadasi training with him, and then after after that, I was just he was just teaching me um, some basic like when that some my my, my Murugeta, you probably know Murugeta off work yeah i met him before yeah, yeah he's come to los angeles for a baptism that was at at the Selassie or the holy trinity church yeah he taught he taught me a lot of good uh, nabob basic uh, gundasi maram some was more dawi who's teaching me at an early age so they were teaching me all that before i got ordained that's fantastic and um I imagine then like your Amharic has to be proficient because they're teaching you in Amharic, right? They're not teaching you in English. Mostly um, Mark was some English. Margate, Margate the Afwork, he, he taught us, uh, he would instruct us in English. Oh, wow. He instruct us actually in all English. His, his, his English is, is amazing. He, is, he, he was instructing us in English. Yeah, I found that mistaken. I think his, is it his wife who's Jamaican American? Yes, salam, salam Yes, yes. I I think I've seen her singing in Gitz as well as um, performing Gitz poetry. So yeah, yes, she is. As everyone calls her down here, she is basically a mini Margita. Yeah, Maria Mavit. <laughs> yeah, that's what uh, everyone calls her. Down here. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's beautiful that that they do that and that they collaborate. So they must be teaching each other and sharing knowledge, which is, you know, that's an ideal couple there. Um, so that's good. And so you learned how to read Giz out loud. And the pronunciation is very strict for people who don't know, including like reading in an upwards direction, downwards direction, diagonally up and diagonally down and all of that good stuff. And you also learned Kaddase or the, the Eucharistic liturgy. I've seen the kind of wave of the past five to 10 years is that actually a lot of young deacons are more lured into the very instrumental, including the sistrum, including the staves um, of different, you know, waving varieties and shaking varieties and the drums, especially the more faster paced drum hitting. But I, I'd have to be honest and say it's more rare that I find someone who is more interested in, in the regular Eucharistic liturgy or the Kaddasi. And so I've always appreciated that about you. Did, did you find that you leaned more towards Kaddase than Mahalit or do you, you know, I don't know do you love them equally or do you do you prioritize one above the other because my impression is that you prioritized Kaddase but I could be wrong oh no I, I absolutely prioritize Kaddase above Apoquam my preference is Kaddase over Apoquam just because the love of the love of Kaddase I would say would be it was instilled in me when I met my teacher, almost Abayam Adarahan, 
uh, the the way he knew, he served, the way he chanted, Nazi made me mesmerized and say, wow, this is, I have to learn. Like, it's different, right? If I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure I've heard his recording a lot when I was driving on YouTube of the anaphora of the Virgin Mary. There's a recording of his liturgy, and I used to listen to that all the time. I used to listen to Malaka Gannath Gazahainz because it was on iTunes, and then people uh, pointed me towards Abba Yaman and Barhan. And I saw him too, by the way, in Los Angeles one uh, one time. I think the same time I saw Marigita Afwerk, although I don't think he'll remember me. Um, and I've heard he's from the Waldeba Monastery that my my own maternal grandfather and many of my ancestors are are buried at, but I've never been to. And that he's certified in the liturgical school of the lower house of Dabrabai. Um, is is that the standard at your church? Does everyone sing the Qadasi exactly like he does? Is it uniform or is he doing it in the lower house of Dabrabai and then the other priests doing it in whatever capacity they can? So I can speak for all of our deacons, my, who, my church and lo, who learned from, from him also. Some other, some others, you probably know, do you, are you, do you know uh, Deacon uh, Matthias Mahatam from Dallas? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, they they also learned Kadasi with with us from yeah. Allah. They they learned uh, touch base style from him, like all of us deacons. So they were with us learning too. Uh, and they go to a different parish, right? Or yes. Do they come to yours too? Their parish is uh, Georgi's parish. But uh, they have come a lot of times to our church in, in the past. So we we consider them unofficially part, like members of our church, because they've come so much. That's cool. So, but yes, all for all of us the deacons, we all chant uh, like the same style as him, uh, as he taught us, Tachavates. And my other priest is named Memory Tandesa. He is more of a, a libate style. I would say he does a he does a libate style the rob by yeah the upper house so it's just yeah. a, sh a shorter the shorter older version of the eucharistic liturgy rather than the more elongated and what many people consider the more beautiful version that mesmerized you yeah. that that's good and um it's incredible how quickly you picked it up and then you continue to renew it i also like the the way that you focus on that because for me, that and Sa'atat, or the Liturgy of the Hours, are the oldest traditions, the monastic traditions, and it takes, I think, a unique type of person to be mesmerized by worship service that has no man-made instruments, whose only instrument is the God-made instrument of the Andabet, or the mouth. And so you've got something special there, and I'm sure Abba Yaman Abrahan has had that influence on you to do that. In order to give a sample for my audience, do you have any misbak, whether it's the one coming up tomorrow from Azagwe or any other psalm chant that is on your mind? I'd like to get a sample of that from you and then maybe um, another another melody as well. But do you have any any misbaks that you have that are your favorite or that come to you easily? Yes, yeah, so one of my favorite misbaks is Adikase. That's probably one of my all time favorite misbaks. Please, let's hear it Gen in the lower house of Dabrabai. <clears throat> Why was a Mazaguaz and Emanos? A Kola and Monto was the better. Send us up. Say, say it again a couple times. Okay. Okay. 
May God have you hear the melodies of the angels. And I could uh, prompt you with another part, but is there any other part of the liturgy? Obviously, the priest parts are amazing and all that. But, you know, this this psalm chanting or the misbach is notable for the audience who doesn't know because it's the part where the deacon leads everybody, including the priests, in a back and forth, usually three to five times enchanting just one to two verses of the psalms and it gives you if you understand the words an opportunity to really kind of reflect on the living breathing word of god but is there another part of the liturgy where the deacon sings something that it it really touches you that you'd also like to share with us so that we can get a taste of that lower house of debrabai <coughs> I guess I can do uh Sadi and Salam base as well. I really like that. Oh yes. And we I need really... that now because <laughs> we don't have that much peace in the Orthodox Church of Ethiopia. And so yeah. please yeah. um with all your heart sing that prayer for peace for us. Yes, right. Salam. <laughs> Amen. Moving on from the liturgy, which I'm so glad you've dedicated the years to, I know, and I don't remember exactly how we met, but I know we met on social media, and I think it was on IG first, but I know you were um, famous and infamous in the IG circuits for hopping on to, I think, your own lives and hopping on to other people's lives as well. I'd like to get your thoughts on the role that deacons and even the laity could play in talking about God in public places, you know, wherever the people are. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, it's very important to be able to talk about our faith and, and openly in a lot of spaces, public spaces, especially now nowadays, because this generation, you don't really, you don't really see. Uh, a lot of people, I guess, are professing like uh, like the faith, uh, their love for the faith on a social media platform like IG, because uh, I guess out of fear of, of people um, judging, be like, oh, you're too religious, uh, you're too you're too that, so com comments like that. As so out of fear, a lot of people, this generation don't don't profess like. Uh, their faith op openly out unfortunately um but i think uh, i think professor uh, your your faith and showing love for your faith on social media platform is um very very important um and necessary especially now in these times where it feels like a, a lot of people in this generation are I'm getting more and more farther away from uh, from the faith nowadays. So I think it's very important uh, to do that. Have you ever had any real life encounters or situations where someone had tuned into either a live that you were hosting or one that you hopped into somebody else's and it kind of led them to the D-Town communities of Ethiopian Orthodox Christians? Has, has that ever happened or does it usually just stay online? Usually, usually that just stays online. 
to be honest. There was a, there was one there was one instance I, in which someone saw me up on live and I believe I was chanting Zema and they mm-hmm. had asked they asked me asked me um about like where did i where did i learn how did i learn all this stuff? and i just basically explained to them yeah i learned from here learned the style and they they were actually they were interested in the rabbi they're like uh, when, when i heard you chant like i became interested in the rabbi so i'd like to know more about that and then the conversation sort of from there and then um this person was really interested in wanting to learn the rabbi so and I just I explained to them about it and like how I learned in that process. That's good. So you're able to pull and draw them in through your love of the liturgy and inspiring them to love the liturgy in a way that they hadn't done before. On that subject, has Abba Yamara Barhan um, ever spoken to you about his time at Dabra Abbai? You know, of course, uh, it'd be great one day maybe if I could have him on the program to speak for himself. But is there anything that you can say about that? school of liturgical learning to the audience <clears throat> he told he told me more stuff i was saying about what about the never i'm by okay well they're next door neighbors yeah <laughs> they're both dedicated to saint samuel of wadipa yes um he, he he was telling me one time a couple years ago he was t- telling me about um well First, one thing that really shook me when he told me just casually that he is related, actually, to Abba Samuel Zawad by oh, generation. Oh, that's crazy. Like, by, by my bloodline. He just somehow. Wow. But Saint Samuel was uh, a monastic, right? So it's like through one of his siblings or something? Possibly. Um, or was he married possibly. and then became monastic later? We have some monks I, like that. I would say possibly maybe through a relative of Abba Samuel as well. The relative probably had kids, and, mm-hmm. and then they had kids and so forth up until leading to my, to my Amba. Probably that's probably the most plausible explanation. Yeah, that's a mystical connection. Did he tell you anything about life? I love the Waldeba Monastery, by the way. I know you and I talk about it online before, and I always tell people about it. Again, I've never been. My mother had this horrible, harrowing situation because. Uh, a nasty set of church administrators in Addis Ababa were throwing people's bodies out to make new space. And um, like a decade after my grandfather was buried, she ended up having to rebury him. And so she said, you know, I'm not dealing with anyone in Addis Ababa. I'm going to our homeland, to Walqait, and Talamt is where uh, Waldeba is. So she went there while it was under the Tigray region. So even before the war, it was back in like 2011. And she reburied him there after like, 15 years i forget the exact amount um i think he passed away in 95 when i was like five years old so like yeah it was it was a horrible situation but her family took care of her as soon as she got to that that region because she had a lot of family that still lives there and um with all of her might she went and and reburied him there and even the last leg of the trip you know certain parts of the monastery women are not allowed so she had to rely on her male cousins to kind of take him the last strip of the way but it's it's a very meaningful monastery to me and and to my family um and in fact his grandmother was a monk there because her husband um had passed away in like when she was in her 40s or something so ever since her 40s she was she was a female monk there um but is there anything about the Waldeba monastery or the way of life there that Abba Yamana would tell you about you would tell us how he had to him the other monks uh, would have to walk there on foot for six hours to get to the rabbi to get food because he said well there wasn't much food all the food was at um at the rabbi so we'd have to walk on foot for like across a the river trip. yeah across <laughs> this hour trip to get with the rabbi and get food and then come and come back that's yeah, where he those... was... go ahead go ahead that's where he um met ambaragawi they knew each other back a while ago I believe also that's where he was, uh, where he was with an Abaga world. I don't know if you know Abaga world. He's from Las Vegas. He's in Las Vegas now. I don't know him. I I do know Abaragawi. You know, he did the liturgy for me at my wedding, and um, he was on this program as well. He's been on the podcast. Right. Yeah, uh, Abaga world. He's um, 
he's the bio he's uh, uh Yamana Burhan's the biological brother Yamana Burhan from the Sky Who's Nine. That's his they're our biological brothers and uh, he's uh, my Abba's uh arguably closest friend. Wow closest friend uh, uh, ever. Uh, they've been through a lot together and their kandasis are almost like nearly identical. Like if you hear them like together, their kandasi they like mirror each other. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it shows that the source is is one. You're talking about somebody being curious earlier after having heard you singing the liturgy online. Um, what tips and tricks for learning the liturgy would you give now that you have hindsight and hindsight's 2020? What type of tips and tricks would you give as advice to, uh, let's say, a deacon struggling with the liturgy? Uh, hint, hint, wink, wink, me. No, it could be anybody in the audience. And also, what type of tips and tricks would you give to the laity who have sort of no base at all in in getting to love the liturgy and getting to learn the liturgy? <clears throat> Okay, some some tips I would say is um, first start off uh, taking baby steps into doing it. Don't try to rush and doing trying to learn uh, a bunch of parts at once. Maybe just try to learn one one certain part to, uh, each day. Try practice it, practice saying it each day. Um, ask ask a local priest at your parish parish church. Um, for training and help with it and also um go on i would say use ethiopianorthodox.org um to revise uh, to liturgy ethiopianorthodox.org they have a lot of um resources for liturgy especially uh, the rabbi um st style they must for different part different uh, kandasi parts for both the giz and isl uh, sectioned off so um utilizing uh, definitely utilizing those resource resources and uh, one thing i would say is it's a it's a continuous process so don't feel discouraged really down if you see if you see you can't get it uh, first time you see someone else that's better at the liturgy um it takes it all takes time for me it for me it's took a couple of years process i didn't get it i didn't get it down right away at the rabbi honestly even though I, i've heard it i've been hearing it since my childhood for a while i didn't get a grasp of it until a couple of years later on through a lot of practice repetition listening to voice recordings and one-on-one -on -one training one-on-one -on -one time with my my teacher so it all takes time it's a process you shouldn't feel um discouraged by anyone you see you see that has a better liturgical vo voice um sound better because it's it's a it's a process um i believe everyone has everyone has a different um gifts uh, calling in, in the church uh, different different strengths for some people some people maybe they uh, for the liturgy they're able to personally say some some maybe some good are preaching others uh, um proficient in mesmer so it's everyone has a different strengths in the church so um you shouldn't feel let down just because someone is better at the liturgy than you we all have our own strengths god god given um um strengths um we have so um i would i would say don't be discouraged if someone get that's better than you just keep keep working at it to keep, be consistent at it and uh, don't give up don't give up and learn to trust that is a process and to be patient with it that's all good advice sound advice and just a couple more questions before we close out here could we close out here with why you like Andasi more than Mahalet or the Eucharistic liturgy more than the non-Eucharistic liturgy and then I'll leave it open to you any other closing thoughts that you want to add and then I want to bother you at the end with one last thing for you to sing, even though it's the Nifk Diakon or the assistant deacons. I think we really need mercy and forgiveness at this time. And there's this prayer where we ask for mercy and forgiveness for all the archbishops, bishops, episcopate, priests, deacons, and indeed all Christian people with Maharomu Igzio.
It either goes or isn't. <coughs> Repeat the first part of the question. So the first part, why do you like Adasia better than Mahalit? <coughs> Honestly, I feel whenever I hear Kandasi, I feel uh, I feel some something drawing me to it sp spiritually. Like uh, I, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it in words. It's just there's some something profound about it that like draws me to it more than than Mahal than Aquaquam. Like whenever I hear Aquaquam, I I don't feel. I don't feel like the level of I don't feel as drawn to it as I, I do Kandase, particularly the Rabbi style. I was especially the Rabbi style. I'm I'm very drawn drawn to it, so how it's how, how it sounds. It's very uh, it's very soothing to, to to the ears. Very very um soothing to hear um and. Uh, it's there's some i just feel i just always felt something uh inside me drawing me more to kandasi than akokon and do you have any other closing thoughts or anything you want to say before i ask you to say maharamu i was gonna say i was gonna say a quick zema from the that's non eucharistic liturgy i was gonna say a zema from uh uh the Makadem for Tom or Mariam. Okay, we can hear that too. Is is that a priest part or a deacon part? The pr uh, priest says it's... Okay, all right. We can close with that. Let's close with that then. Go ahead. I am not a God Madani da da mukona dama zenge ki krusto se zenge na tamare ki bara ga se ga wana bakama sa ga da na wadiki yohan hezwekas